Cash Flow Diary Podcast, episode 428. Welcome to yet another exciting episode of the Cash Flow Diary Podcast, the podcast that teaches you insider tips, tactics, and strategies for creating leveraged streams of cash flow into your life. Learn from top performing entrepreneurs, business owners, investors, and thought leaders from across the globe as they share their secrets to success. Like what you learn on this and other Cash Flow Diary podcast episodes? Go to learninvestingnow.com and sign up to receive powerful tips and information that will help you succeed as an entrepreneur and investor. Now, here's your host, investor, entrepreneur, business owner, educator, speaker, author, and master facilitator of Robert Kiyosaki's Cash Flow Game, Jay Massey. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of the Cashflow Diary Podcast. I'm your host, Jay Massey, and I'm glad that you're here today because here's what I know. I know that a number of you, you're at the beginning of your journey, and you're wondering, how on earth am I going to make this thing happen? In fact, there's been a number of you who have contacted us recently saying, Jay, uh, I'm trying to break into consulting. I'm trying to go out on my own. You are, as I would say, striving for your independence, and I get it. It makes a lot of sense, but yet there's this elusive thing known as cash flow, and that's what we like to talk about here at the Cash Flow Diary, how to make it, how to grow it, how to go out there, and really take more control of some of the things that you want to make happen, but using your talents and skill sets to serve people in a very, very special way. Well, I have with me today a guest who's literally written the book on how to help you do that. What do I mean by that? The title of the book is The Irresistible Consultant's Guide to Winning Clients, Six Steps to Unlimited Clients and Financial Freedom. Now, what I like about that is just simply imagine, if you will, a situation in which you win more projects from more clients at higher fees, period. Win more projects from more clients at higher fees. If listening to this episode helped you do that, got you one step closer, would it be worth it? I think the answer is yes, and so does our guest today, Mr. David A. Field. He's a managing director of Ascendant Consulting, a group of elite independent business consultants whose clients span the Fortune 500. That's code for they've done work with a lot of the brands and people that you and I absolutely recognize, but more importantly, they've had success with them too. He's been named one of Advertising Ages Magazine's uh, marketing top 100. Now, think about that for a second. If anyone named you to anything, was it a good thing? The answer is yes, but more importantly, the top 100 means it's time to break out that pad, that paper, that iPad, that note, whatever it is that you use to make sure that you mark the golden nuggets that are about to drop. So do me a favor and help me welcome David A. Fields. David, you there? Yes, thank you. You know, I could just listen to you all day. I'm happy to just listen to you. Not the introduction, just listen to you speak. <laughs> thank you. I appreciate that. We have uh, heard that more than once. But we can't do that. We're here to to pick your brain today. We We must understand everything that's in your head as much as we possibly can. Now, with this being your first time here, though, I do have uh, to ask you the same question I tend to ask everybody else. You ready? You bet. All right. I tend to look at today's entrepreneurs a lot like yesterday's superheroes. So, you know, Wonder Woman, Batman, you know, The Flash, what have you. (laughs) I think entrepreneurs and superheroes have a ton of things in common. Occasionally, as an entrepreneur, we can envision ourselves, you know, flying around the city, saving our customers one at a time, using our special skills and abilities. And for some of us, maybe we even dress up for the part. Also, like superheroes, an entrepreneur has a beginning. So if you think about Peter Parker and Spider-Man. There was a time where Peter Parker was just a, you know, kid going to school. And then he had a job taking some photos. Then one day he gets bit by a spider, realizes he's got a special ability, and he gets the option to use it for good or evil. However, an entrepreneur is kind of just like that. So here's what we want to know. Before being, you know, featured in publications like Bloomberg, (laughs) USA Today, CNN Money, before, you know, writing your book, before being the, the, the sought after speaker that you are today, what we want to know is who is David A. Fields? All right. Got it. Well, I'm not a superhero. 
I can I tell you that much. Disagree, but okay, let's go for it. <laughs> well, let me put it this way. You see, what I think, you know, you, you talk about Peter Parker. So Peter Parker got bit by a spider and all of a sudden he had superpowers. And I don't think I have superpowers. And I don't think anyone who succeeds in, in being an entrepreneur, I, I kind of call it the everyday hero level. Not the superhero level, not mm. not necessarily Bill Gates, Mark Cuban, but the everyday hero, someone who can reliably bring in, you know, a solid seven figures a year, which mm -hmm. is pretty good. Mm -hmm. You don't have to be, you don't have to have superpowers. You don't have to be bitten by the spider and and all of a sudden be able to jump higher and leap further and shoot webs. But I think you do have to uh, improve yourself by listening to shows like this, and I think you do have to have resilience and be willing to persist and, and do a few things right. Um, but that said, let me let me answer your question so I, I'm not dodging it completely. Uh, I, I won't go back to my misspent, misspent youth, um, but I, what I will tell you is I started, I started off in corporate America, hmm. you know, after business school and all that, and did uh, marketing and, and some sales and something called trade marketing before going into consulting. And worked for a boutique firm, worked my way up, to, way up to partner, and here's where things got interesting. One of the other partners in the firm and I decided to spin off hmm. and form our own firm, Ascendant. You mentioned Ascendant. Yes. And so we created this firm, and the, the roles were I would be in the back room modeling and analyzing and coming up with great solutions because that's what I'm good at. I'm good at modeling and analyzing and coming up with great solutions. And my partner, my co-owner, co-founder, he would get clients because that's what he was good at. And these were the roles we had played when we were partners at a boutique firm, a larger firm. So that worked really well for about four weeks. <laughs> okay for four consecutive weeks okay i got it yeah exactly yeah and then my partner who is a great guy uh just love him nice guy um but he decided the entrepreneurial thing wasn't for him Ooh. and he had the wherewithal his, his uh wife is a senior executive at a, a very very large company and um he you know decided i'll, I'll stay at home with my kids Mm. which is just great for him, but I did not have that luxury. Uh -oh. And so I found myself um, with a consulting firm, but with no clients. Right. And with uh, no cash to speak of, you know, it, it was a pretty difficult situation. Wow. And, you know, if anything, that was kind of my spider bite. <laughs> <laughs> yes. It, you know, is I found myself, ooh, something's gone wrong. And, and in in complete transparency, Jay, the first year was rough. The first year was tough. Hmm. And things didn't really turn around. You know, I managed to get a client or two. But things didn't really turn around until a, uh, a colleague I was working with on a project who was this kind of grizzled old, uh, he probably wouldn't be appreciating me saying that, but this veteran from Philip Morris. He mm -hmm. used to run Philip Morris sales, um, wow. a division of Philip Morris. And he said, you know, David, you're actually uh, a good sales guy. You should be selling consulting services. And I hadn't realized that or I had forgotten that mm. I could actually win business. And once he reminded me of that, it, it changed the course of my entire business. And I, and I changed Ascendant from just me doing the consulting to a consortium of, of consultants where I bring in clients and I oversee projects, but I bring in other smarter people mm -hmm. to do the work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and that's been the model up until, uh, well, still the model today. And then about six years ago, some of those consultants started saying, you know, um, I really appreciate all this work you're getting for me, but you asked me how much I would charge for a project. And, and I said I would charge $120,000 for it. And then you sold it for four ninety five. <laughs> How? <laughs> right? How? Can, can you show me? And you know, and these guys are all fine because the way I run my my consortium, if I, that, you know, this is a, a real example. So this project I sold for four ninety five. When you say four ninety five, be clear where the comma is. 
$495,000. Yeah, I, I just wanted to make sure people understood. Yeah, sorry. No, that's that's right. Not $495 million or $495. But, um, you know, so he made, a, you know, probably close to twice what he, what he would have if he was just charging on his own. And you can imagine half a million dollars creates a, a lot of cash flow and a lot of runway. Mm -hmm. So I started working with consulting firms and showing them, well, how do you win more projects from more clients at higher fees, which is, is how you put it. And um, that that business has just been phenomenal. Uh, I, I love working with independent professionals, people who want to help other people and showing them, you know, here's how you actually get the business. Mm -hmm. So that, that was kind of my spider bite moment in, in, in the middle there. Yeah, no, I, I like it. I like it. In fact, it, there's always that defining moment with nearly every entrepreneur that we've talked to. It, what happens is they go, oh, well, th this is what happened. And then but yet you did something that I, I have to ask about, because often when many people get that spider bite moment, they see the opportunity. They feel they should go in some direction, but not everybody goes, well, I'm going to go make it happen because you were given an opportunity. You could have made a, a a completely different decision when the partner left. You could have said, oh, I've got no sales department. I guess I'm going to go back and get a job. But you didn't do that. And, no. and and secondly, when you got the the opportunity, to, when you realize that, hey, I can provide more value if I also start showing other, you know, uh, independent professionals how to go out there and win more business. Here's another thing that I can do. But sometimes people see that opportunity and also shrink back from it. What yeah. makes you different such that you made those different decisions? Well, and that goes back actually to, to the first point. And I really like that question um, because I, I don't, again, I don't know that makes me different, but what I'm willing to do and what I hope every one of your listeners is willing to do is I'm willing to persevere. Mm. I'm willing to try again. I'm willing to do, so, do something knowing that not that it could fail, but it probably will fail. <laughs> and, and that's okay. I can get up. I can try again. It's not the end of the world. Most of us, we, thank our lucky stars, we are not uh, fighting in, in uh, say, Afghanistan or somewhere. We're not putting our lives at risk. Right. At most, we're putting our pride at risk. Mm. And if, you know, if you're willing to hurt your pride a little bit mm. and you're willing to be resilient and you're, you're willing to, to try again and you're willing to get help, and that was another thing I didn't mm. mention, is I, I got help. I found a mentor who was willing to give me some guidance so that I wasn't just, you know, it's one thing if you're, you're running in the wrong direction and you stumble and you fall and say, well, I'll get up and keep running and you keep running in the wrong direction. That's unfortunately not going to get you to your finish line. So in addition to being willing to get up, it helps to have someone who will give you a nudge and say, hey, you know what? Like, like uh, Bob did for me, and, and he said, you know what, you're actually really good at this. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, that was a nudge. And then also I had th this sort of mentorship saying, here's a little bit better way to do this. Here's a little bit better way to do that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I don't think I'm different from your, your listeners, and I hope every one of them is willing to, to get up and try again and willing to invest in themselves and get some help. Indeed, indeed. I've often said to people that you cannot learn and look good <laughs> at the same time. So I like how you mentioned, you know, the, the thing we really have at risk is <laughs> our pride, which kind of just hits straight at the point. But it leads to my next question. In your journey, how many times have you found that the answer to whatever it is that was, you know, that roadblock came from somewhere outside of yourself? <laughs> that, well, that's an interesting question. Philosophically, Jay, I believe that all the answers come from outside yourself, <laughs> um, especially in my business. Got so it. one of the, the very first things I, I teach folks is, and again, remember, I, I tend to focus on consultants, but I think this is probably true of almost any business. I tell consultants, consulting is not about you. Hmm. It's about them, the clients. It doesn't matter what you want to do. It matters what they want, what they need. It doesn't matter what you find you know, really interesting because what you may find really interesting is buggy whips and nobody wants buggy whips. Not right now. Right, not right now. <laughs> and so it, it's really 
Uh, I think a lot of the answers are they're, they're not from inside. It's from looking outside. It's from looking at the world and seeing what is the world telling you. Now, that doesn't mean that the crowd is always right. It doesn't mean your clients are always right, because sometimes clients don't know what the heck they're talking about. But it, it does mean that you work with them, not at them. Got it. Right. We we are never the answer. Um, if we're if we're in a service business and if you truly believe in servicing your clients and truly believe in being customer focused, that means you're not the answer. Yeah. It means there's something in your customer that, yeah. that that that's where the answer is. So let, let me ask you this, because and, and maybe it, it's just my skewed perspective. I don't really know. But over the <laughs> past few years, it it seems to me that I'll take the U.S. as a whole is moving towards more independent professionals doing their own thing in, in various yeah. forms. Have, yes. Is that something that you've noticed? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Good. There's uh, for a, a whole host of reasons. I think that in the younger generations, mm -hmm. the there's a more of an enjoyment and a belief of, of being independent, of doing things yourself. I mean, there, there are so many role models for kids now of entrepreneurs who are uh, 15 years old, 18, 20, 25, 30 years old, who have written an app or come up with a great idea and done well. So that encourages the youngsters to not just work for the man, as we used to say, right? Not just work for the big company. Right. And then on the flip side, you have the baby boomers who are at an age where they're starting to, to leave Mm -hmm. corporations, but they mm -hmm. still have a lot of good years. Even old folks like me have a, a lot of years left to, to add value. And so where do they go? They go out on their own. And then, of course, in the middle there, you, you had a bit of uh, a few years ago, you had this recession and a jobless recovery. And mm -hmm. so uh, all of those sort of combine. There's this confluence that's saying, yeah, I, I think across the demographic spectrum, there are a ton of people who are in working independently and yeah. finding ways to contribute and create value uh, more than ever before. Yes, absolutely agreed. Now, one of the interesting things uh, I think about this is it, it's a lot of, as you were mentioning, they, they, there's still something where you can add value. You have valuable wisdom, valuable insight, valuable skill sets. But it seems to me that some of the, the basic skill sets to even put what you can do to work are missing why is it that so many consultants have challenges getting new clients? Well, a lot of it is because they're looking in the mirror too much. And going back to what we were talking about just a moment ago, hmm. your client is not in the mirror. <laughs> your, your, your client is through the window <laughs> or something like that. Got it. And a lot of consultants, they struggle. Uh, I mean, th th that's a big question. But the the biggest issues is they tend to pay too much attention to themselves and what they want and mm -hmm. what they want to do. OK, OK, and, hold, on, hold on. Give me give me an example. What do you mean when you say that? Because I, I, I'm not understanding what you mean when I'm how would I be paying too much attention to myself if I'm in a service business trying to serve other people? I don't I'm confused by that thought. Sure. I, I'll give you that, that's actually a really um, easy example. I will I will bet you dollars to donuts that there are listeners out there right now, whether they're in consulting or they're in some other independent field, if you ask them what they do, mm -hmm. it would take them probably five minutes to describe because they do a lot of things and they want to do a lot of things. I talked to a consultant uh, yesterday who recently left a super well-known brand name consulting firm. So th mm -hmm. this is someone who's like a Harvard graduate, uh, very high end. And so what do you do? Well, I do strategy work and I help people in operations and improve their margins. And I also with them on the marketing strategy side and cost reduction and M&A. Right. And he's listing all of the things he can do. I see. That's paying too much attention to himself. OK. That's not looking at at the market. OK. You look out at, at the market. So I'll give you another example. Um, and this is actually a client who signed business with me today. So it's fresh in my mind is a, a client in the Midwest. Now, this is a small firm. This is really a solo person. And he's doing about two million dollars a year right now, well, that's which is too bad. Not too bad. Right. And his expertise, I need to be careful because I, I don't want it to give away too much. But it, it, it was I said, what do you do? 
Well, I help manufacturing companies that use the Astra 480e platform and are struggling to get that implemented. Okay, do you notice the difference between on you know, level of yeah. specificity? Yeah. Yeah. And what he found is that Astra 480e platform is a need. It, he can do lots of things. Got Once it. he gets in there, they ask him to do not just the Astra 480e, they ask him to do all the things that that smart guy from the big company does. But he didn't go out to market that way. He went out to market realizing it's not about what he all the things he can do. It's about what the market is asking for really specifically that he could do. One thing, one problem that he could solve. That's okay. being market focused. All right. Does, well, does that make sense? Does it that makes help? sense. But I'm going to play uh, right now. I'm going to play play a little bit of Dev's advocate because I know yeah. someone is saying, but. But David, I can do all these other things. How do yeah. I know I'm going to make enough money to live if, I, if that's the only thing I'm talking about? Hello there, entrepreneur. This is Jay Massey. I know that if you've ever gone over to the site, cashflowdiary.com, you may have asked yourself, where on earth do you get a domain name from? Especially as you are beginning to build your bigger, better, better business, you need a web presence. You need the email address. You need a way for people to contact you electronically so that you can stop doing the at gmail.com game. Well, the good folks over at GoDaddy have definitely supplied us with every domain that we have ever used. So what I want you to do is I want you to go over to trygodaddy.com forward slash cashflow diary. Again, that's trygodaddy.com forward slash cashflow diary because it's a quick way for you to get set up to capture your domain name the exact way that you want it. They got easy search functions. And most importantly for you is that you'll be up and running today. As I said, once you get started, stay started. Don't let small little obstacles of how to get your own domain name going stop you. So again, go to trygodaddy.com forward slash cash flow diary and let's get back to the rest of the story. Yeah, um, that that's a, a really common fear. And Jay, when, when I drive down the highway out here, and uh, I'm in Connecticut, mm. there's this billboard which I just love. It's on Route 95, mm -hmm. and the, I, I have no idea what it says other than it shows Mr. Shower Door. <laughs> okay. That's the business, Mr. Yeah. Shower Door. Now. Anybody who's going by that billboard, if they have a shower door problem, who do you think they're going to call? I see. Right? Uh, because yeah. now yeah. I would, I'll, I'll guess that he also has a business like Mr. Bathtub or something like that, right? But the, so for one thing is when you're very specific, people will call you if they have that specific problem. They're going to call you before they call the next billboard, which is Mr. Do Everything. Got it. No one's calling Mr. Do Everything. But you still have a legitimate fear. What if there's not enough business there? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I have a couple of thoughts on that. One is roughly $800 billion is spent every year on services and service type businesses, advisory businesses, I should say, whether it's consulting or architects or attorneys or mm. you know, any kind of advice. It's $800 billion. I definitely have Which contributed is, to that number. Yep, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, see, right. And, and so like that's enough for me and you, Jay, and at least a dozen of your read, your, your listeners. At least. Right? And, and maybe we could even let in a few more. Right. <laughs> There's a lot of money. There's just a lot of money out there. So that's part of it. The, the other part of it is, well, yeah, you do have to pick a problem that is it pervasive enough and expensive enough for people to leave unsolved that you'll get business. Now, how big does that have to be? Let me bring this guy who just signed with his business today um, mm -hmm. because he said something interesting this morning as we were talking. He said, uh, and I'm uh, going out to his place with one of my partners mm -hmm. to help him work on the next three years. And he said, David, remember, for me to get from two million to three million, I only need three, four more clients. Not 300 or 400, three or four. So you don't need thousands. You do need a network of a hundred. You do need a universe of potential prospects of call it 200 to 300 total, total mm. period, total, the whole world mm. for you to have a 
very, very healthy, thriving, sustainable business. You're, you're bringing up something that I've also witnessed and, and wondering if you've seen it too, because you said you got to pick a problem that's pervasive and expensive enough. How many times when you're working with someone, do they just charge too little? I mean, the guy you mentioned earlier, you said well, he would charge 120 for it, but you sold it for 495. That's like not even in the same ballpark. Is he was he <laughs> undercharging? What's the difference? Yeah. I mean, that's not a little bit higher fee. That's tremendously different. Yeah, that's tremendously different. That's what I call a higher leap. Um and m- when I was a kid, my my dad would say, "David, when I say jump, you say and then how high?" Exactly. Thank you. And, uh, you know, so the, the question is how high, how high is that leap? And that's a much higher leap. In many, many, many cases, people are undercharging for their services. Now, that's not always the case. Mm. And here's the flip side, which is a little odd and a little ironic. Mm. In many, many cases, people are underpaying for their services. What? Yeah. So here's and here's why. Here's here's the, the reasoning on that. And, and I just got a bill from someone on, on a project I'm doing. A consultant sent me something. And, and I took a look at the fee. It was a little bit higher than I was anticipating. And my reaction to that was, no problem. And paid it. Mm-hmm. Because I want the people who work with me and for me to be delighted. that they're they, To feel like they're being treated well and to go the extra mile. Okay. You see, the difference between charging $120,000 for that project, which was an operation-related project, and four ninety-five, dollars was at $120,000, if we wanted to do something different, if we wanted to try something different, if we wanted to invest more, if we wanted to, uh, you know, whatever it would take to make the project work. And remember, the idea is we're not, we're not the, the client's not spending, uh, spending to have us, um, you know, just devote time or do tasks. The client is investing us to re- achieve a certain result. Mm-hmm. So if we only had $120,000, there would be this, this kind of uh, barrier, this feeling like, well, I don't know if I want to try that because we're not getting paid for it. But at four ninety five, dollars I, I have the room to do anything I need to. I can do anything. I, I can, t- in order to get the client to the best possible result. Hmm. A- and the best possible result is worth, in this case, is worth tens or hundreds of millions of dollars to the client. So what does it matter a few hundred thousand dollars? It, it's right. So we often underpay because we're looking at the wrong side of the equation. We're looking at what does this cost me as opposed to what will this do for me hmm. if it works? What will it do for me if I get the best possible solution? Got it. Got it. So how does... One, know if they're undercharging, because I, I know someone's like, if I don't ask you that, they're going to email me. <laughs> That's a, that is one of the hardest questions to, to answer. Uh, and, and I get, as, believe me, I get asked this question every single day. And, and, and I encourage the question, even with, with the consulting firms I work with, they ask, am I pricing this right? And could I charge more? That is the hardest question in our, in our business. What mm-hmm. is the right way to charge? And and so I don't have a simple answer for you other than most consultants, not all of them, but most consultants and most independent professionals I run into could easily double and probably triple what they're what they're charging. Wow. As, but again, I, I, it's a really important point here. I'm I'm expensive. There's no no question about it. And my clients know that. But the idea isn't that I'm gouging my clients because I don't believe in that. The idea is. I can create higher value and mm-hmm. higher value is worth a premium. Got it. Right? So, then so the so pricing, yeah. so, uh, oh, sorry, 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 but then based upon that, then what you're saying is that pricing is based upon the potential value you can create, not necessarily tying it to maybe what you need or what you're used to or, or et cetera. Right. Oh, absolutely. Right. The, one of the, the, sort of the holdovers from when the whole business of consulting started. Consulting started at the same time as as all these sort of time and, and effort studies were happening in the around the Industrial Revolution. And the you know this whole idea of well so we should charge by the hour. It it, it grew up in that same 
that same time period. And, and as a result, there's still a lot of uh, consulting, a lot of professional services are done that way. People charge by the day or people charge by the hour or, or by the week. And that's the, not always, but a lot of the time, that's, the, that's not the right way to charge. It's not good for you and it's not good for the client. Because the client isn't paying you for a day's work. The client's not paying you for an hour's work. The client is paying you for a result. Hmm. Yeah, I get that. And that result has, okay. So then let me let me poke at it one more time. Because yeah, that result <laughs> has a different value depending on, you know, company A, that the result, it could be the exact same work, right? So let's say I'm... Um, I'm an advertising agency, right? Or I'm I'm trying to do Facebook advertising or something. Well, client A wants to do fa- Facebook advertising in some way, shape, or form. But for them, if you know the best possible result is you know worth a million dollars of revenue, but client you know C or B over here, best possible result is two hundred thousand dollars of revenue. Yeah. How do I charge them the same? I don't understand. You don't. Okay. Oh, okay. You don't. I mean, my, my work with boutique consulting firms subsidizes my work with with uh, solo folks because so otherwise solo folks, I, I would never be able to help them because they, they couldn't afford it. And the boutiques know that. Um, so, no, you, you don't charge the same for everyone. But that also means unless you can unless you're willing to do what I'm willing to do. Right. I'm willing to take loss on, on small folks. It, it means you also be choiceful about your clients. There are a lot of people who, who make um, money working with startups and working with turnarounds. But that's not where I play for the most part. I don't, I don't play with turnarounds, for instance, because they tend not to have as much money. And I, I'm kind of like the Willie Sutton. You know, He was asked, why do you rob banks? And his answer was, because that's where the money is. <laughs> <laughs> you know, So I, I like going where the money is. So right. th- there is some benefit to being choiceful about your clients. And if and if your clients or your customers are not the type that want to engage with you, that want to jump into action with you, that are willing to invest significantly, you know, maybe you want to say thanks, but but no thanks on that one. Interesting. OK, so there isn't necessarily because in my head I was like, well, how do I make a pricing table and tell people what I charge and all this? You don't. I, and now, yeah, so that, that that was kind of like my next question. How does the system work? If I'm gaining more projects, more clients, higher fees and making this thing go, how do I do that if I if I haven't standardized, you know, my, my list of services in some way, shape or form? Well, you don't want to standardize your list of services. Not, I mean, you, you, I'm just going to keep letting you talk. Go. <laughs> no, that's all right. <laughs> totally you're, asking the, you're asking the right questions. Got it. When you standardize your list of services, now who have you made your consulting offering about? You or the person you're listening to? You, you've wow. made it about you. You said, yeah. these are my standard services. Got it. Now, should you have certain kind of standardized approaches and processes and things that you do? Yes. But you have that as a way of accomplishing what the client needs. You don't lead with that. And you don't let that dominate what you do. Instead, you walk into to a client and find out what they need. And then, again, I think this is true of almost every business except uh, consumer products. For your consumer products, you have to make your bottle of water, and that's your bottle of water. Right. Or your, your bottle of soda, and that's your bottle of soda. The, but almost everything else, especially for, for those of us who are entrepreneurs, we can adjust. That's the great benefit of being an entrepreneur. And especially in this kind of services business and an intellectual business, you can adjust. And that means you can tailor your solution to fit your client like a glove. What you need, Jay, is very different from what even another radio or podcast host needs. And therefore, if I come in with my pre-baked, off-the-shelf solution, it will fit you okay. But it's not going to fit you as well as if I take the time to really understand you, really understand what you need, Mm -hmm. what will help you achieve your aspirations. And then I can use some of my my pre-baked approaches where they're appropriate and say, what about if we use this piece over here that I've got that I use a lot and this hammer that I have in my toolkit that I use a lot and this clamp that I use a lot and we put them together, you think that'll get you where you need to be, Jay? And you say, yeah. I say, perfect. 
Perfect. And then we can have a conversation about what is that, you know, what's the value of that? And does it make sense for you to invest in, in achieving that, that outcome? Hmm. Yeah. Does that all make sense or did I sort of go off into La La Land there? No, it, it makes sense. It's just <laughs> you're it just makes the it, it has the potential. It's going to require just different skill sets. It's not a this is the, in order to perform this type of sale that you're referring to, which, again, I know I've done many, many times. I, I'm I was just thinking completely differently than <laughs> at the beginning of our conversation than I am right now. Because um, this is not, it, it really isn't, you know, the numbers game per se. It's more of taking the time to invest to understand the client's needs. Is, at least that's what I'm hearing. It's like if you Absolutely. understand the needs first and create the customized solution, then you have a shot at being able to, again, win more projects, give more clients at the higher fees. That's what I'm hearing. That is absolutely right. So there, the, this book you mentioned at the beginning, my newer book, yes, it has six steps in it. Yes. Uh, six steps to unlimited clients, financial freedom. So step five is becoming the obvious choice. And what I say is becoming the obvious choice boils down to one word, discovery. When you conduct discovery, when you understand and discover the, the, what's driving your prospect better than anybody else, perhaps better than he understands himself, right? then you can create the solution and offering a, uh, a combination of terms and benefits that makes you the by far and away the obvious choice versus doing nothing versus someone else versus using internal staff versus you know, any other option. But you have to do that discovery. You have to understand them. That's what drives this. Interesting. So in essence, would you would it be fair to say that most people are skipping steps and trying to take shortcuts to get to the sale? Oh, you betcha. Got people it. are skip. Not only are people skipping steps, they're very often misunderstanding where their uh, new business pipeline or new business engine is broken. Hmm. There, there's a uh, what well, I get. You're I assuming get they have an engine first. <laughs> well, yeah. Let's assume everybody's got at least some engine. Everybody's okay. trying. Right? right. Everybody's working hard. And so I get calls from folks and they say, David, how can I get in front of more people? Hmm. Step three in your book, which is maximizing your visibility or, or increasing your visibility. How do I get more visible? How do I get in front of more people? And my answer to that is usually you don't have a visibility problem. Mm -hmm. You think you have a visibility problem. In most cases, you have an impact problem. You need to go back a step. See, well, I'll tell you a slightly embarrassing story. When I was a kid, mm -hmm. I played Little League, just like you know, a lot of kids. Most kids play Little League. Mm -hmm. And I was the only kid in Little League who had a zero batting average. <laughs> wow. I don't mean you point were perfect. Something. That's perfect. I mean zero. <laughs> yeah. I could not hit the ball. Wow. Now, some of it may have been I was slightly afraid of hitting the ball, but for two years running, I never hit a pitch. I would have had a higher batting average if I had just put the bat down on home plate because, you know, sometimes those pitchers in Little League, they throw it short and it hits the plate. I would have done better just doing that. <laughs> oh, my gosh. It, it, it didn't matter how many pitches I saw. I had no impact. I couldn't hit the ball. Wow. And for a lot of people, that's where they are. They think they need to see more pitches. But the fact is, they're getting in front of people. They're just not having impact when they're in front of them. Wow. <laughs> so the first thing you need to figure out is how do you hit the ball, wow. right? How do you have some impact? Yeah. And then once you've got that figured out, then let's get you in front of more people. Then let's let's build your visibility. Yeah. Okay. I see. I see where this is going. Yeah. I, I get the idea uh, of, of, of what you've developed here. I like it a ton. In fact, I'm I'm going to take a stab and say that there's a number of people who want to hear more of what it is that you what you've got going. What's going to be the best way for them to to find out more about what you're up to or maybe even grab a copy uh, of your new book? Well, the the easiest way to get a copy of the book is you can either go to amazon.com or Barnes and Noble or any of those places and and look up win uh, guide to winning clients. If you look guide to winning clients, you'll you'll find the book. Or you could go to winclientsnow.com, and there's a free chapter. 
uh, the, the, one of the nice things about the book is I've got a ton of online resources that go along with it. So once you're in the book, it, it gives you an address. There's all sorts of online resources and exercises and templates, scripts. I mean, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and of course, I always invite people to you reach out to me, go to davidafields.com, uh, click on the button that says I'm a consultant and, you know, take a look around, ask me questions. I, I I'm here to help people succeed. So if you need help succeeding, if you're a listener, you want some help, reach out. That, that's why I'm here. Awesome. I, I, I absolutely appreciate that. Now, what I'm going to do is uh, I've got a final question for you, and I think it's going to be interesting to hear your response. Okay. <laughs> so let's, <laughs> let's pretend that someone listening, they're, they're standing in front of what I would call the superhero outfit store. They think, you know what? I'm going to do this thing. I'm going to become an entrepreneur. I'm going to make that happen. Or they're like, you know what? I'm ready to take my business to that next level. And as often happens when we go through those, you know, thought processes, we think of a goal that's going to take us to a bigger, better place. And then what happens is our, our brain starts with this, this voice uh, that tends to happen in the back of our head. And, and that voice often reminds us of what we can't do. Who are we? I mean, you, you do six figures. How are you going to do seven? You do seven. How are you going to do eight? I mean, who you, yeah. you're going to leave your job. And for some people, <laughs> they're even related to that voice. So my question to you is as follows. Let's pretend for a moment that the person listening is actually going to follow through and do exactly what you suggest. And they're going to do so in the next 24 to 48 hours. What would you suggest that they do? Well, the first thing they should do is listen to that voice. Don't run away from it. Don't <laughs> shut it down, right? Which is probably what most people say. I, I don't know if you could, could you hear the echo in, in the background, Jay? That that was that voice booming. Right. Because I've got that voice. Everybody does. And that voice is good. As long as you manage it, you got to listen to that voice, take all those objections, take, take all of those concerns and write them down. And then, then comes the important step of saying, okay, how do I address that concern? What could I do? So that voice might say, oh my God, nobody will hire me. Right. Okay. Write that down. Well, what could I do to address that or to test that? Well, one thing I could do is call around to people I know and say, hey, is there any circumstance, any circumstance by which you would hire me? And as long as someone says yes, OK, well, you know what? I can I can tell that voice. Thank you for raising that really important issue. I've got that one covered. And there might be some that says, wow, if I don't get a client within two weeks. I'm going to have to declare bankruptcy. Well, to that voice, I would say, thank you for reminding me. I better get a job. Mm. because this is not a two week to client kind of business. So, uh, you, you know, we all have that voice the question is, does that voice scare you? Does that voice rule you or do you, do you use it? Um, and, and I vote for use the voice, listen to it, embrace it, move past it. <laughs> it's your free consulting. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right I love that. <laughs> totally understood. Well, I definitely appreciate uh, the the wisdom, the insight, and the knowledge that you you shared with us here. It's been truly completely different than what I expected. Even better, and I, I'm excited for people uh, to have heard you, and more importantly, to follow through and understand more about what you're doing. But again, thanks for taking the time to invest here with us today at the Cashflow Diary. Jay, my pleasure. Anytime. You're doing great work. All right, ladies and gentlemen, you know what time it is. It's time for you to move at the speed of instruction. What does that mean? That means get over to winclientsnow.com. Why? Because you want to win clients now and you know that. But more importantly, you probably want to do better. You want to increase your batting average. So if you're currently batting zero, just know that there's lots of room for improvement and you just listened to someone who can help you knock it out of the park. So I think it's a great idea. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been fun talking to you guys today. I look forward to talking to you soon. Until next time. <laughs>